How We Make Movies is recorded in front of a live audience in Los Angeles and is hosted by WeMakeMovies.org. Hello and welcome back. I'm your host, Amanda Lippert, and today we are talking with writing producing duo Steven Skaya and Matthew Fetterman. Steve and Matt produced uh, television series Charlie's Angels, Human Target, Warehouse 13, and Jericho. And they're currently making the transition from TV into film and working on the uh, next Zorro script. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I guess they're calling it a reboot. Yeah. <laughs> so please welcome our guests, Steve and Matt. for joining us, guys. Mm -hmm. So um, what to start, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Where are you guys from originally? Let me go first. Uh, I'm kind of from all over. My family's from back east, but I kind of grew up all over the Midwest because of what my dad did for work. So mm -hmm. I lived anywhere there was a, a military base or a GM plant. So <laughs> were you in Cincinnati at any point? I was. That's his superpower, by the way. Oh, yeah. He's always from, if we have a meeting, so he's always... <laughs> I'm always from where you're from. He's like yes. 10 miles away from wherever you were born. And it's true. And yeah, it's true. where'd, where'd you go to Where'd you go to high school? I went to Lakota West. Okay. And I went to Taylor High School. Okay. Where'd I went go? to Alter. Oh, cool. So, yeah. Cool. I went to College of Mount St. Joseph for a little while, too. <laughs> so you've all seen the magic in that. <laughs> so that probably works really well in meetings. And what about you? Where are well, you from? Well, this is where it works poorly. I'm from Philadelphia. <laughs> oh, Philly, Every Philly. now and then, someone is very excited, and we talk about cheesesteaks for five minutes. Yeah. It got us a job once. It did. It did. It's right. That's good. That's good. And my dad was very excited because he had uh, reconnected with his favorite childhood um, cheesesteak place. It has a terrible name, but awesome cheesesteaks. It's called Chinks. It's a real name. <laughs> oh, God. And the derivation of it is actually as racist as you'd think it would be. <laughs> but that's Philadelphia. Is that like that place has been in business for like 50 years or whatever? What are you going to do about it? Yeah. And uh, someone said, what's the, what's the best cheesesteak in Philly? And I said, oh, God, this is, there, there's no good way to answer this question. And I said, I, my dad loves this place called Chinks. And he goes, yes, that is the right answer. <laughs> and we got a second meeting and we got the job. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So um, where did you go to college? Did you... Stay in your hometown, or did you go somewhere you go else? This okay, this is the second part. I kill a conversation. Okay. Uh, I went to Pace University. <laughs> now watch, watch this. I went to Emerson College. <laughs> we know who the more popular one is here. Yeah, my school is known for accounting. If you were uh, a bunch of accounts people, you'd be like, oh, Pace, hey, very good. Ooh. It's one of the big six or something. I don't know. Like, is that is that what you something. originally wanted to do? Was no, no, or? I wanted to not have uh, college debt. And for some reason, I've since like one of our friends Why is a. Why did you go to college at all then? Because I'm Jewish and middle class. Uh, so it's, like, it's mandatory. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I didn't know what college was before I knew I was going to end up there. Okay. And then uh, when I decided I was going to be a writer, much to my parents' horror, I it was well, you're going to college. I, okay, fine. So I looked for places with programs. There's so many famous Jewish writers, though. I don't understand. Why would they be upset? It's a weird thing where yeah, you'd think because it's like uh, like Jews are strangers to Hollywood, right? I mean, <laughs> so you know, it should be, but it's but if I you're. I actually thought about converting once I moved here. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's That's it's not I a bad career. Partner. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's it's weird because where we were from, it's like you were a teacher. And that's what my parents were. And that they're, why don't you be an English teacher? And I was like, because you're miserable. <laughs> <laughs> why don't I want to do that? Um, so yeah, for it's it was not helpful. And then I got out here, and I'm like, oh, here's where they've been keeping all the Jews who are in entertainment. Yeah. And uh, and it's been fine ever since. Yeah. That's where they are. <laughs> and the then, secrets out, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and so, what was your major at Emerson? It was uh, uh, literature and communications, which was because that's how so you that's how much they didn't have a major. Was it was like. Well, literature and communications, that's kind of like the same thing. It's not at all. Like, so there would be people like me that were into reading, mm -hmm. and then there was people who were, wanted to do like marketing. or something. And that's, those people don't necessarily have that much in common. Right. Uh, but I luckily had a teacher who I found, there was a class that was like introduction to screenwriting. I don't know why they had it, but they did. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting, because I thought I was going to be a novelist. And I took the class, and I immediately kind of fell in love with the structure of it because I didn't realize how much I like structure and writing. Mm -hmm. And I thought like, well, if you look at famous novelists, none mm -hmm. of them are famous before they're like 30, except for like Stephen Crane and he died young. Um, and so I was like, oh, but screenwriters, they seem to be able to make it in their 20s. Yeah, you're going to flame yeah. up by the time you're 37. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then I can, you know, go through my coke phase and yep. then rehab and then transition out to novels. And then write your memoir. 
Exactly. I've got it all planned. Yeah. Um, so yeah. you, so that's, you always knew you wanted to be a writer, but that's when you knew you wanted to be a screenwriter. Yeah, and then um, the, in this professor's class, I was the, the assignment for the whole semester was to write act one of a screenplay, mm -hmm. which is 30 pages, mm -hmm. and I was the only student that finished it. Wow. And, she was, and the only student she ever had who finished it. Wow. And she was like, oh, <laughs> do you want to finish this screenplay? I'll give you three credits. And I was like, yes, I do. And then that went well, and she said, I'll, if you want to write another one, I'll give you another three credits. And I said, yes, I do. And so I wrote you know, my first two features. And you know, so I didn't go to film school, but I got. I just had this one person who was like, "I've never had a student that was into this. I'm gonna just give you, you whatever you yeah, need." Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know. And, and what about you? Did you always know you wanted to be a filmmaker? Did no, you? I. Uh, I was gonna. I was gonna go to the Naval Academy and be a fire be a fighter pilot. And I realized after watching Top Gun for like the 5,000th time. I watched that, that about 5,000 times too. <laughs> right. But as it turns out, that's not actually what it's like if you join the Navy. Mm -hmm. It's and not volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. So I got pretty far down the line um, and uh, I realized, oh wait, there's this thing called propaganda where they make movies <laughs> to make you want to do things. Mm -hmm. I think I've got this all wrong. I'm going to go make the propaganda instead. And so. <laughs> Here I am. And is that what you studied at Emerson? Yeah, I was a I was a film major at Emerson. I was more of a more of a director than a writer, um, but it was a mass comm film. I think is what my degree ended up being. Cool, very cool. And then, at what point did you guys end up in New York or in LA? I'm sorry, New York is <laughs> on my you mind. You got there way before I did. Yeah, I think so. I, I came out right after college, so I, I spent before we met, and I'm I will get to that I guess, but like, um, I spent years and years kind of doing everything and nothing all at once to the point where, I mean, I, were, I was the concierge at Beverly Hills Country Club. I taught history to yeshiva. I, um, I, I just had a lot of ridiculous jobs. I can't top that. That's, yeah. What, what, I don't think I even knew that. I think, yeah. I think <laughs> that should come up by now. What, what were some of your worst jobs that you've had? Oh, well, I mean, I have, I've had a lot of bad jobs, but I think the worst job I've ever had was I was at, okay, I have two worst jobs. One was I was a dishwasher in a restaurant, and the reason that that's so bad is because I'm also a bit, it's dirty, and I'm a kind of a germaphobe, <laughs> which I've like now realized, but at the time I was like, everything grosses me out. Yeah. Um, and then also your hands are in really hot water, and then they give you like steel wool, which kind of bores into your flesh. You didn't use gloves? I didn't know about gloves. And nobody told me. <laughs> so, so that was miserable, and then they were also kind of bigoted. So it was a lot of like... Stuff that, you know, it's like, oh, my hands are bleeding. Can we, like, let go of the Jew jokes for just, like, five minutes oh while God. I wrap my hands? Um, and then I also made cheesesteaks for a while. And I quit that job because that guy was also bigoted. I know it sounds like it's I have a Philadelphia, thing. Philadelphia, the city of brotherhood. It, yeah. It's a fairly bigoted city. It really is. Really? Um, yeah, I yeah. About, a, about a lot of East Coast cities, though, don't you? Because you have so many cultures piled Maybe, on top yeah. of each other. Yeah, but it's like, oh, come on, Kim, I'm just busting your balls. Yeah, yeah. yeah because Philly is like New York with an insecurity problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, it's all the same attitude, but uh, the anger is a little more real. Mm -hmm. And people don't frequently leave it. So you have generations of people that can point to oh, you know, mom lives there, grandma lives there, and they can point to, you know, their houses. And so it's, I think that kind of spurs a lot of like, well, you know, you're not like us. You're, so, you're different. Yeah, you're, exactly. you're bad. Yeah. So, you know, you got out of that. That's fine. Uh, that's good. That's a good thing. Well, what point did you guys end up in L.A. after college? Oh, I, I came out in uh, 2001, so I was... I was 25 by the time I came out, so I took so, a different path. I, so you took a few years off after college? I took the dicking around path. Uh, I don't know if I can say that on your podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Around. I, no. think, I think we have explicit on oh, the podcast, okay. so you can awesome. say whatever Sweet. you want. It's good to know that early. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, had a, I, I just kind of didn't know what to do after college, because mm -hmm. like, the path to being a writer is just like, well, you just got to write. And it's like, thank mm -hmm. you. So I did that, <laughs> and then I kind of realized I wasn't, I wasn't really writing a lot, and I was miserable. I was working at TV Guide at one point, writing copy. Mm -hmm. um, but oh, that's, I, I know a lot of people that did copywriting. They're like, oh, well, at least I can make a living oh, yeah, it's, doing writing. It's so horrible because it's like um, you think, oh, well, I'll be writing. Mm -hmm. And then I would, they would give you whatever the episode was, and I would write like a three-sentence thing, and I'd send it in, and they'd send back topic, colon, breast cancer. And I was like... Yes, that's a much faster way of saying it. Than <laughs> so, you know, I, like, I went through that depression of, oh my God, this is not even writing, but, you know. Um, and then I eventually moved out and, and I, I kind of said to myself, you know what, you don't have anything to write because you, you haven't lived. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going to take like a couple years off and just not think, I'm not going to put any pressure on mm -hmm. myself. And I'm just going to take temp jobs 
and take as many different jobs as I can. And so as soon as I would learn how to do the job, I would quit it quit. and move on to the next job to just kind of like get a lot of ridiculous work experience and life experience. Were your parents getting a little worried at this point? Um, I think they're just in a, they were in a constant state of worry. Just like from me, <laughs> I'm going to be a writer oh, and right. I will settle for nothing less. They're Jewish parents. They're always yeah, yeah. going to be worried. They stopped being worried when we got like our first writing job. Okay. And it was a show that they watched. And that's when the first time I actually heard the sound of relief in my mom's mm. voice. And I'm like, oh, that's what that would sound like <laughs> if I'd ever heard it before. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so I, it was, it was a lot of that. And then eventually I moved to Seattle for a company and it was a whole thing. And then I, I eventually moved down here. And so it was, uh, you know, I was 25 and a very old PA, you know. In my was that job. your first job? In that was LA? my first job. It was on a, a, a basic cable show that was awful. And uh, it, it was a good first job to have because my resume was largely lies. So I never <laughs> worked in production. Yeah. So I had to, uh, there was a lot of kind of like, in this call sheet, um, it works. How are you saying? How does it work here? Does it work the same way as it does in Philadelphia? Um, and so I, uh, you know, I, I kind of, I, I started figuring all that out. And by the way, it's not rocket science. And then I very quickly realized, oh, this is a terribly run off. It's like, there's some things that I don't know because I don't know what I'm doing. And there's some things that I don't know because every single piece of paper is telling me to do something different because this office is horribly run. Um, and I didn't learn a good office until we worked on the West Wing, which was like such a high paced environment. The office had to work correctly. Also, the job was the job was insane, yeah. and so it had to be well run, or else the whole place would catch on fire and burn to the ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you guys yeah. were responsible for making sure it didn't catch on fire. Yeah. Um, we, well, I mean, I, I set a few fires. Back <laughs> in those days. That's true. We got frustrated. Yeah. yeah. What about you? After college, did you come straight out to LA? Yeah. I mean, I went to Emerson, so I I came out here with. Uh, you know, a caravan of probably 10 cars. We all just drove across the country. It's going to be great. Uh, Hollywood's awesome. going to be thrilled to have us. Woo! <laughs> We're going to be, you know, working on blockbusters in six months. And that just isn't the truth. Why Why um, is that? It never happens. Yeah, I I got to think it's, it, I don't know how anybody does it, how anyone moves to LA by themselves. Like, mm -hmm. I, if I didn't have the support structure of, this is insane, right? Like, mm. these people are terrible, aren't they? And they're like, yeah, let's go get some pie. And you're like, oh, thank God. At least there's some normal people here. I found a roommate online is how I did it. Yeah, see, I'm surprised you were not murdered. <laughs> well, I actually found that. Like, Unless you're the murderer. Oh, yeah, that's true. I've never heard of that guy. Yeah. 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 So how did you guys end up meeting? So uh, I got a job in the West Wing through a very random set of circumstances, which partially had to do with that. That roommate at the time worked for John Wells Productions. And I had no fax machine or anything. And so I was sending out resumes from his fax machine. Mm -hmm. And it printed out his header at the top of it. And that caught someone's notice because they knew him. And not, you know, and they're like, oh, why do I have this resume for this guy but with your header? And he was like, oh, that's my roommate. You should go meet him. And so I went in and met on the West Wing. And it was right after 9-11. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, by the way, there's been a threat against the studios. And so if you would like to leave. And I was like, no, I'm good. I, I believe in statistics. Tell them about the call sheet. That's my favorite part. Oh, yeah, yeah. So like, one of the first things they did, because apparently they had a run of bad PAs, and they said, uh, and this, by this point I knew production, and they said, um, do you know how to read a call sheet? And I said, oh, yeah, and, you know, obviously. And they uh, were like, do you mind taking that call sheet off the wall, and we're going to ask you some questions because <laughs> everyone lies to us. And I took it off the wall, and it said, it said day, day 14 of 8 or something like it was it was like yeah. something like that it was it was some kind of compound fraction that should never happen in a call mm -hmm. sheet and i was like how are you day 14 of 8 and they're like oh you notice that that's off right you know what i mean cuz you they, will fit right in here yeah exactly cuz the show is always so over mm -hmm. that you know and so they were like okay so you handle the stress well of a potential terrorist attack and you know how to read a call sheet <laughs> <laughs> welcome aboard you're hired yeah and so uh, and so you know i got the job and then the guy who i was working with when he left, Steve came on board because he knew Steve. Because I went to Emerson. Yeah. And at that point, I was, I was directing industrial films. So I was making like ladder safety videos. And you know, I was directing. Sorry. Guys, I was, I was in production. I was running, <laughs> running the show. The Fall is going to kill you, part one and two. Something was lacking, yeah. Um, and, uh, and he said, hey, I'm, I'm going to go do this other job. Do you want to come in and interview? Because I know you love the show. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds cool. Is it a fun job? And he's like, oh, no, it is the worst job you will ever have. You will <laughs> never see your friends again. They will pay you nothing. If you do your job well, no one will ever learn your name. And if you, the minute you screw up, they're going to shout and scream at you, and you will cost them tens of thousands of dollars every minute you mess up. All right. I love that show. It'll be fun. I don't, it's on a lot, right? I get to wear a badge. Yeah, cool. And so I went in. They, um, 
they they hired me because I too could read a call sheet, mm -hmm. and uh, we were that was it. We were off. I mean, we. Is there some place online you can take lessons on how to? Do call sheet. We should make, we should get rich. You off guys, that. yeah, you guys could like how to get hired as a PA in just Hollywood. Teach, like some sort of like lecture about it. Yeah, or just yeah. do a thirty-page ebook and sell it for thirty dollars. Even online. better, yeah. an app. Right. Yeah, <laughs> an app. That's the best. That's very hot right now. Um, yes, we're, we're and by the way, we were going to do that. Everybody, so no one steal that idea. <laughs> it's ours. Um, but yeah, so we met on we met that on that show, and it was the the best and worst place to meet somebody because. It wasn't meeting someone at their best. It was meeting someone exhausted after being up literally 24 hours mm -hmm. and having to make split second decisions about where a script needed to go because you would you would constantly get scripts that were that he, you know think a lot had been changed right. and you needed to, when you're making 200 photocopies because mm -hmm. this is still back in the glory days of 2000 when you couldn't email it you had to hand deliver it oh. and you would the script would come in at eight o'clock at night which was already a little behind mm -hmm. and then. You to would, shoot that m the next morning. The next right. morning at six a.m. Yeah. is call, and you're you get a script at eight o'clock at night, and the I think the turnaround time for us was about two hours to get a script out. Get I mean just get a script copied, not even counting the time it took to drive around to Martin Sheen's house, and like everybody. I had passed. cuts with Brad from Brad's all over my fingers. It was ridiculous. It was Aww. like stigmata, but from Brad's. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't all bad though because I got so good at the um, at the PA huck which was you roll down oh. the window and you grab the script and you would make sure the script was in the right spot in the manila envelope, that if you, you flipped your wrist just the right way, it was like a boomerang or land right on the doorstep. I don't know if you're trying to torture me with that story, but my most embarrassing moment as a PA before oh, you Oh, I didn't even think about that. That's <laughs> I, uh, solid gold, man. You gotta I, in my own hand, I had developed the PA Olympics because you know when you're doing anything <laughs> that's really boring, you start to make a game out of it. And yeah. like, you know, you just imagine. So all the things that, like, you know, when I was bratting a hundred things in my head, there was like a stop clock and like a line of PAs next to me and we're all racing against each other. And so <laughs> I would, I, I developed the thing of uh, to fling the script and get it as close to the door if it hits the grass you're out of balance you know like a whole set of rules and by the way you the way you describe this it, it's like it's like you're living in Shawshank like that's <laughs> where <you know. laughs> um and so one fateful night uh you know there was the house there and I and I did my patented you know wrist flip and the script caught a freak breeze and oh. sailed upward and went on top of the guy's house and it was the first AD <laughs> and I was just it was just one of those moments where it was like whoosh, and then like my mind did the calculation of Oh my God, it's going too high. And then it went, <laughs> and like skidded across the roof. And I just was like, oh, And you didn't have, did you have backup? Well, I had other scripts for other people. Right. And by the way, before you leave, everyone's labeled for the person because it's, it's super top secret. It's the yeah. glory days of the West Wing. So that's that guy's script. The glory. So yeah. Matt's got to get that. So my, literally my first thought is my career is over because they're going to fire me. I would not be able to get another PA job. It was just like, you know, it was the entire series of like linking up with my mom's fears for me. It was like, <laughs> and then I will be homeless. And so I called, uh, I called, you know, the, our mutual friend and I said, uh, okay, I gotta, I gotta tell you what just happened. And I told him and first he laughed for, Literally five minutes, and I, I know that's like, but if you think about someone laughing just for five minutes while you think your career is destroyed, and he said, okay, okay, and he knew enough about the different actors that he was like, okay, Nicole Robinson, she's awesome, and she doesn't shoot until much later, so take her script, go give it to the guy, tell him there's a script on his room, <laughs> you're gonna come back here, we'll get Nicole her script later, and so I did all that, and it was fine, but it, you know, but it was that kind of job where it was like, you cannot success. Successful, successfully doing your job is just like someone walks out and there's a script there. So you can't really do anything awesome. You can only do it correctly, mm -hmm. or you know, you fling it on someone's roof yeah. and, you, <laughs> and you get a fine. And, and there was, it was, it really felt like graduate school to me because you learned very quickly who was important on any given day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, the star is always important. Of course, absolutely. But also, if you read a script, if you read a scene that has changed and now there's a prop that wasn't there before you better, the first person after number one on the call sheet better be the prop department. Cause that's still shooting at six in the morning and you, they need to know. Mm -hmm. And so you got really good at learning the ins and outs of production just to keep the train rolling. And it was one of the things there was, it was a thankless job. And by the way, no one would notice if you, when you, when you give it to the prop person first, they're not like, oh, Skyat, boy, I, got, I like your moxie that you thought that through to give it to me first. It's just like, <laughs> they look at a script and they're like, holy fuck, where are we gonna get this necklace before 6 a.m. And then they're off. Their hair catches on fire and they run. You know, it's just like you're just trying to keep the fire down. That's all you're trying to do at that point. So, so moving on, you guys were doing this job. You're working as PAs. You're in driving yourself insane yeah. in a trailer. Uh, what 
was the next step that, that kind of started leading you to where you are now? One, uh, one night we got sent to dinner at like at eight o'clock when you're, when you've been working at the office till since like eight in the morning and eight o'clock rolls around and you're like, oh, it's going to be sweet freedom at like five after eight, he's going to send us home. And then it was always the worst when five after eight comes and goes and he's still in his office and you're not, you know, oh no, he's, he's still in there. And then he comes out at 8.15 and says, hey, why don't you fellas get some dinner? And you're like, it's going to be one of those nights. Okay. Take, you know, take your time. Take like two hours. And he's like, oh, it's going to be one of those nights where you, you get home long enough to shower and come back to the office. Yeah. Where like you, the level of exhaustion you have is like there was one time I... I came home, it wasn't one of those nights, I actually was gonna get to sleep for a few hours and I couldn't sleep. I was like keyed up from the constant anxiety of this job. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna make some, I think I was gonna make either make some tea or some soup. Long story short, I put the stove on, turned it on, went to the, went to the, like, the um, like where the TV would be and the next thing I remember is it's seven in the morning and all I can smell is burning oh, and like no. the, the tea kettle had melted. Like I just left it, <laughs> I forgot all about it. The water was gone, like that's, and it was like, oh, thank God I almost burned the house down. I would have, I would have been late to work. <laughs> that was my first time. <laughs> Did the smell wake you up? Yeah, yeah. And You're like dreaming about the house totally. burning down? Yeah, yeah, thank God. And so you would, have, you would have nights like that, and one of those nights we were walking back from dinner, dejected about what can we do to improve our state, and he was, he, he's like, hey, I read this really interesting article, right? That's where it all yeah, started. Yeah, I, I had like a, a year before I had read an article online and I brought it to one of the writers and I was like, this would make a really interesting West Wing plot. And she, she said, yes, it would, you should write it. And I said, oh. thanks, thanks for the blow off. You know what I mean? It, just, <laughs> it really just seemed like a blow off, but she was like, no, no, really, you should write it. And then I said, okay. And then, I, and then that was the end of that thought for a year. And then at some point I met Steve and he is a cesspool of military knowledge. Yes. And I said, okay, I found this thing, but I don't know what to do with it. And then he started spinning out, well, here's the way it would work. The CIA has a sector chief here, here, and here. And so he starts doing a whole thing. And he's like, by the way, I'll write that with you if you want. And I said, no, I want to be a solo writer. I'm good. And then I did nothing. Cut to that <laughs> night and as we're walking home and it came up again and I was like, you know, I keep saying I want to be, like, I, I never imagined having a writing partner. It had just never occurred to me as something I would do. And by the way, me neither. Yeah. yeah. Um, you always wanted to be a director. Yeah, exactly. So, right. yeah, and, but it was like, but I'm not actually writing. So, and I'm writing, not actually directing. Yeah, so, <laughs> might as well do something with our time. And so, start, and by the way, we're not going anywhere. Yeah. Like, we're going to sit in that, in that trailer and stare at the, the tell, ceiling. Tell me about the trailer again. I remember when we had our phone call and you told me about the trailer and how small it was. It was, Describe yeah, like our desks were. Yeah, here, let's, know. let's. <laughs> okay, so ready? It's like, uh, I, gotta, I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know. So it was, it was pretty awful. And, uh, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you, get, you get close to somebody when you've got to, you know, Tell them to move in every time you have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. Sitting around, yeah. each other's farts for yeah, exactly. yeah, it's hours like it really becomes like you you've been in the foxhole. Like listen, you do we, judge the person when they come back from craft service. Like what are you eating there? Yeah. Uh, no, no, you're not allowed to have that in. No anymore. beans. No beans for yeah. you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And we would play the game of like there was it was our two desks and a water cooler, and we would play the game of who could who could leave just enough water in the water cooler that you were not the one who had, because when you emptied it, you had to refill it. So it was the trick was like, no matter how hot it was and if the air conditioner was broken, I'm not getting water. Because that's where one glass away from having to switch it, I do not want to change the water in the water. So you dehydrate yourselves. It really was like prison. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, you guys decided to write this script together. Yeah. So we wrote it together. Long story short, it went well. I mean, it was the first time either of us was writing with someone, so it was bumpy, but it was, it was, it was, it was working and it was sounding like a West Wing script. And it was one of those things where we gave it to like a friend to look at it. And then a couple days later, someone else was like, that was a great West Wing script. And we're like, how did you get it? And he was like, well, I got it from this guy. Well, how did he get it? Well, he got it from this guy. And you know, so it was getting passed around, which is always the sign of like, oh, something's working here because mm -hmm. I, I'm not having to push my writing on someone. My writing is finding people. Mm -hmm. And so we're like, oh, this is, we should maybe do this again. And, and so as that was kind of working its way around, we started working on something else. And then we submitted that to a couple, there was like spec contests out there and that went well. Um, and then- it was, it was actually like a nice like triangle of things coming together where it was, We'd submitted the festivals, and at this point, it was now a year later, and um, I was still working on the West Wing. I had I had moved up, but it, were, it was really a lateral move to being an assistant on the show, where I was I was no longer making copies; I was answering phones. And one of the producers <laughs> who 
who I, I, I was working on a sitcom called The Mullets. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought that would get a better. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't see that one. <laughs> no, no one did. So the, the producer, I'm, I'm one of the producers I'm staffing, she was super cool, very nice, like took an interest in us and was one of those really nice people where I hope I can be someday where she noticed when you did a good job, which, mm. hey, like that's awesome. That was the first. First time, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and she said, oh, do you, you know, what do you guys, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm a writer. And she's like, well, let's see your stuff. And I gave her the West Wing and then I, I gave her the, um, the, the spec we had done. And she's like, this is actually really good. Um, I don't know what to do with it. And then we had won the, that weekend we came back from the festival and having won the Austin Film Festival. And it was a for thing your, that like, for, your script. for our script, right? Yeah. For this spec script that mm -hmm. like, I don't, I guess I could give it to my agent, but she's not really gonna, she doesn't really. And what had happened was we'd won that festival. And now it was that moment of like, oh, well for this one, like for the next three days, people are actually gonna like ask who you are. Mm -hmm. And so it just, it landed on our desk at just the right time while well, another friend of ours had given it to somebody else where the, the producer's agent was walking by someone else's desk and saw our script on some other agent's desk and that was all she needed to be like, I gotta meet these guys. Cause like Cause once it, the yeah. fear kicks it's in- It's the like, first we'll rule of Hollywood. It's yeah. like nobody wants you until someone else wants you and then, yeah. you know. Yeah, and it was only on that agent, agent's desk because the assistant was reading it who was a friend of ours who had left it on that desk. Oh, that's very clever. And we didn't even yeah. like, it was magic, yeah. <laughs> so the great thing about being an assistant is you meet other assistants and eventually you hopefully rise together because you're all, you know what I mean? You're all kind of like yeah. looking out for each other and yeah. in the end the, the assistants have so much more power than people who can't, like writers, you can tell the writers who came up in the industry and the ones who came from something else because mm -hmm. the ones who came from something else treat the assistants like shit. And you're like, oh, buddy boy, you have no idea. Let me guess, like, you worked in Washington, you wrote speeches for yeah. somebody. Oh, were you a lawyer? A big high price lawyer, perhaps, in New York City? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you didn't You didn't make copies in a basement with no ventilation for eight months of a year and <laughs> never go home and lost all your friends? But no, <laughs> wouldn't have noticed. You don't sound bitter at yeah. all. <laughs> <laughs> you sound so grateful for that experience. So, so um, that led you to to get it, you wrote the West Wing script right. that, got and, and then you got the Austin script yep. one, and so then you got a rep representation. Yep, and then that next season, uh, we were staffed on our first writing job. So we got our first staff job. And that was through your agent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. What, what was that job? Uh, well, it was obviously judging Amy. If you look at these two guys, and you're like, what are these guys who love <laughs> the military and history and explosions? Yeah, our spec pilot had no less than 100 casualties in yeah. it. And <laughs> when, and when the guy at CBS was being, he was like, it's an interesting sample for judging Amy. And we're like, yeah, well, you know, we kill shit. So just know that going in. There's going to be casualties this year on judging yeah. Amy. Um, but the guy who ran the show at that point, uh, you know, liked the cut of our jib enough to give us a shot and then we were told he wanted to buy us shoes by our agent. Yeah, we were I like, know what that means, but that's I guess Maybe it means good. you looked so poor and you had bad shoes that he felt We were told it's a good thing. Yeah. I don't, like, it means he wants to take you under his wing? I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> um, but he didn't he didn't stick around for very long and then we met Or buy us shoes. Or buy us <laughs> <laughs> um, and the person who took over was this uh, woman named Carol Barbie who is our our favorite uh, showrunner in Hollywood, I think it's safe yeah. to say and we have a whole career just because of her. Because even even in the Judging Amy days, she saw the thing in us that mm -hmm. was like, you know, it's interesting because you fellows aren't the first guy. You're not the first. My first choice is for this, but I like you guys. And someday I'm gonna have a show where a lot of shit blows up, and you're gonna be my <laughs> first phone call. And then cut to you know, two years later, she gets assigned this pilot, Jericho, about everything blowing up. And sure enough, she's like, guys, remember, remember how I told you. And that was that was that was the like that was sort of like the thing that really got our career like going in the direction of things making sense. So I was looking at your IMDb and it said you produced those shows. So were you guys writing those shows or producing in, or both? In, in TV, it's like when when you move up the ranks as writer, you become producer. So because it's a writer's medium. Um, okay. So you know the the titles in TV are weird yeah. because there's like story editor, which doesn't have anything to do with editing stories. Right. Um, and then you know and so you just kind of rise up the rank and you do get more power, but it's uh -huh. very specific to each show. Like we had more power on Jericho. As 
co-producers. As co-producers than we had on Charlie's Angels. Which is down here, supervising for us or up here. Yeah, mm -hmm. but just because the way each showrunner uses their writers, some people, they like the writers to be in the room. On Jericho, we were in casting, we were in, you know, we produced our episodes. But you guys were writing them as well. Yep. Yeah. But that was the credits on IMDb. Yeah, so, so you know, you've got a writing room of maybe 10 people, mm -hmm. and everybody's writing a different episode, and then but you're all breaking them kind of in the room together. Well, on some shows, you're mm -hmm. in the room together. But that was a very serialized show, yeah. so we had to, even even if someone was in the room, if they're off writing their episode, you'd have to be like, okay, uh, we're killing a character that's, that is a storyline in your episode, so hold on for a second. You know, so you were always having to check in with each other, yeah. you know, whereas on like Law & Order, you could all go off and write your own thing, because mm -hmm. like, yes, they'll find a body in the first minute. We okay. all know that. Yeah. <laughs> it's inevitable. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so you guys uh, ended up producing a bunch of shows, mm -hmm. and now you are getting into feature scripts. How did, what was the decision tree that led to that? <laughs> uh, we really want to write features. We we, we wanted to <laughs> we wanted to do movies, um, and we were always looking for kind of like the right thing. How do we become movie writers? And I, my mom, who's a librarian, and our 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 development executive, because she every time I go home, she there's a stack of books on my bed. Um, that are like, oh, that's a good book. Oh, you know, Brad Pitt just optioned that one. Oh, there, that one's in production. Oh, I've never heard of this one. What is this? And it, that was one of those books that she gave us. It was called The River of Doubt, and it's all about Teddy Roosevelt, true story of Teddy Roosevelt going down the Amazon. And I thought it was cool. I read it. It was an amazing story. Mm -hmm. I gave it to him. He enjoyed it as well. And we're like, well, let's do this. Let's write this movie. And so the first thing we did is we went to our feature representation. So at your agency, you have your TV person and you have your feature person. And the first thing our feature person said is absolutely not, do not write this movie. Yeah, this is a waste <laughs> of your time. It, it, like, it's a period piece and we're like, yeah, but it's Teddy Roosevelt and he's awesome. And we're he's so like, passionate about this. And they're like, no. It is no. a waste of your time. So yeah. we, we decided to ignore our representation and, and simultaneously, um, John Turtletaub, who directed the National Treasure movies and, and their company was involved in Jericho, he had come to the book from his own angle. Mm -hmm. And so they had heard, oh, there's the other two writers that were looking for it. And then he said, who? And they said, Fetterman and Sky. And he said, oh, we know this guy. So they brought us in and they said, we'd love to do this, but we don't see how this is a movie. And we said, well, you're in luck because we've been thinking about it for six months now and here's how we want to do it. And they said, that's great. And so we wrote it with them on spec. Um, figuring, okay, well, you know, this guy is, he's the guy that made National Treasure, right. and this is kind of a real life National Treasure, mm -hmm. and that should work. Slam dunk. Well, to this day, you know, it's never been made, obviously, <laughs> but uh, it's the, that first okay. thing, you just hope to be a sample, and yeah. it, it did everything a sample can do. It, it ended up getting us the job on Zorro, mm -hmm. and it got us the job on Why the Last Man. In lots of interesting meetings where you get to meet cool people, Yeah. and you talk about movies you love, and then hopefully six months later, they call you because they remember the conversation you had about this thing, and I found this book, and do you want to come in again, and we'll talk about it, and maybe we can set it up someplace. So is Zora the first feature script that you're writing that you think will get made? Well, it's the, first, it's the first time someone paid us Roosevelt? to work to write a feature, okay. and that's a big first step because yeah, it's that thing of like, well, who are these guys? These guys have never done, wait, someone else is paying them? What? Hold on, you know? <laughs> um, and so it, it's like the moment that came out in mm -hmm. Nikki Fink, because that, that's like, you know, two months after the deal was signed, uh, and then it you know eventually gets leaked or whatever. Suddenly, our phone starts ringing with all these people we had had general meetings with who didn't but, love any of our. They're like, "Oh, that's really interesting," but we never make that movie. Yeah, it's just like you're just kind of not real until someone yeah. has decided to like accidentally. You yeah. Know. So you go back to them, and you say the you pitch them the same ideas, and they're like, "That is amazing. I want to <laughs> do that. I want to <laughs> do that. That is, oh, it's crazy." I feel like, I, how have we never heard anything like this before? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've been talking about it the whole time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now, when we were talking uh, previously, you, you guys really um, emphasized how, you know, you, you're not independent film guys. Right. But you've used that sort of independent spirit to be able to create the careers in, that you've wanted, mm -hmm. and you've had to turn down a lot of jobs and say no to a lot of things by just following your gut mm. instinct. Um, do you feel that that hurt you in any way? I think that if if I if I had it all to do over again, I don't I wouldn't change any of it because we even no. even on the things that were unpleasant, you learn a lot from them. Mm -hmm. And we've worked with huge people, and we've worked, that have been and it's been a terrible experience. And we've worked with people who you've never heard of, and that was awesome, mm -hmm. and everything in between. And I think for us, it, the reason we sort of like feel like we've got that independent spirit is. When we're writing in TV, the 
the idea is you work your way up the ladder. Right. And you, you know, you're a journeyman writer and you spend years there making television, but we wanted to do movies. And so we wrote a movie and they said, this is, they'll never make this movie, don't mm -hmm. waste your time writing this. Mm -hmm. We did and it got us jobs. And so to us, it, was, it wasn't just the creative fulfillment of it, it was, it's actively moving our career in the direction we want to go in. That really strikes me because um, wh what I hear you saying is that uh, despite what everyone else was advising us to do, we wrote the movie we wanted to make. That's one of our key values mm -hmm. at We Make Movies, is mm -hmm. to make the movie that you want to make. And yeah. sometimes that's the hardest thing, yeah. is to just follow your gut. The, 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 uh, all the success we've had, whenever our career right. took like a jump forward, mm -hmm. it was always against the advice of counsel. <laughs> Whatever was, we were doing was like... It was like, us <laughs> doing something that we were passionate about, not something someone's... It wasn't the yeah. safe option, mm -hmm. it was the risk. Like the, the spec pilot that we wrote that got us our agent and everything, when we were talking with people about it, a lot of people were like, I don't know, that kind of seems stupid. And you know, because it was like, it was just out of the curb before they made a bunch of shows just like it. Yeah. Um, and so we just decided to do it mm -hmm. and then it worked. And you know, and so when our career has sputtered, we've noticed it's when we started like, you know, our agents when we became company men. Yeah, yeah. When our agents started saying, "Oh, you know, you should work on this," or you know, you should take this show because this is the popular show this season. Mm -hmm. That's all. That has never worked out for us once. Right. And it's always when we're doing something that on paper seems wildly stupid. And you guys have done a lot of out. pilots and a yeah. lot of shows that haven't lasted that long. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, we are we are show killers. Do not. You know. And I mean, Jericho was killed twice, and that was the first successful show we yeah. were on. It was like, wow, they they just could not let this thing live. Uh, but and, and in terms of like you know a good decision versus a bad decision, you don't know until looking backwards at it because right. like 2010 was a bad year for us. Uh huh. And, it and was, what would you consider a bad year? I the show we were on flamed out mm -hmm. in a very ugly way, mm -hmm. and we didn't go back to it. And we we were we had it was the it was the end of a long run of being on shows that either the show got canceled or, you know, for one, uh, being on a first season of a network TV show mm -hmm. is one of the most exhausting marathons you can have. Because it's, you're not only there all the time, but you are dealing with so many different, the, you know, the, a studio and a network that are literally fighting with each other. It's always changing. Yeah, and it's yeah. exhausting yeah. and you gain 20 to 30 pounds in my case. <laughs> and you know, it's just, it's just, it's just brutal. And we just kept doing that again and again and again. And then that was the last time, you know, and we, we said, okay, you know what? We're not staffing. We are going to bet on ourselves. We're going to try to sell a couple pilots. And we, you know, we ended up doing that, but it was like kind of towards the end of the year. It was a long, we tried to break into features. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to hear anything we had to say. It was just a very long, exhausting year yeah. of like futility and failure, except for in our personal lives where we met the women that we will one day marry. So I <laughs> one of them is in the audience here. Aww. I had to point Small that out. Small Bailey, everybody. <laughs> yes. Um, so personally, it was a great year, but professionally, it was awful. But then, 2011 was awesome, but much of what made 2011 awesome was things the that we had started doing in 2010 mm -hmm. that just didn't land. Like and one of the pilots that we tried to sell, yeah. we finally sold in 2011. Mm -hmm. And so it looked like, wow, you guys are busy. You're doing all this stuff. It's yeah. like, no, this is just the stuff landing that we had started a year or two ago that just didn't break through. But isn't that the way it always works in this industry? Yeah. Yeah. You work, you work, you work, you work, you, you build, build, build up this like, you know, pool of, of things to give yeah. and to offer, and then finally, maybe somebody will take a look at it. Yep, right. Yeah. And so you don't know if you've made, like, when you're doing something independently, and maybe you didn't go on the, the show that became a huge success. Mm. And maybe that looks like, wow, you really made a stupid decision. Yeah. And then maybe the thing that you worked on while you didn't do that becomes the show you will one day run. I think, the, like, the key is to kind of trust your passion because mm -hmm. you don't know at, when you're up at three in the morning in front of a, a computer typing that like, this is gonna be the thing that they're gonna talk about for years on a television show. Right. Like, you just don't know. Right. You just have to trust that like, oh, that doesn't suck. Yeah. Well, that's pretty good. You know, I'm gonna go to bed, I'm gonna wake up in the morning, if it still doesn't suck when I read it again, I'll send it to Matt, we'll see. <laughs> and then, you know, you get far enough down, the, he doesn't change it, then he's like, it's pretty good, I like it. It goes to the next person, oh, that's my, that's, you know, one of my favorite parts of this thing. And so, mm -hmm. you just, after a certain point, you realize, oh, okay, I think, I think I can trust my instincts enough here to get me through whatever's gonna happen because the thing we've learned is no matter what happens, it turns out we're fine. Yeah. You know? Now we, we only have a few minutes left before we start taking audience questions, but one of the things that I really wanted to get with, uh, with you guys was I, I noticed that you seem to do everything together. You, you found each other, you clicked, it mm, worked. Every. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, all, all your credits are matching from here. You're, you know, like you, you are obviously writing partners and you're sticking to it. Mm -hmm. What is your writing process like, your creative process? 
we uh, we break the story together. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, from conception to here is a, a thing. Mm -hmm. We write an outline, a fairly uh, a fairly specific say, yeah. outline. Yeah, like broken down into scenes and all that. And then once we have all of that ready, we separate it out into okay, you're going to write this, I'm going to write this, and and we never want to write the same scenes because yeah. we. You know, naturally, which is probably part of yeah. the strength of it is like he he might want to write the action. I'll generally want to write the talky mm -hmm. scenes, and then we switch back and forth after we've written them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've. I think that's one of the benefits of our relationship is that I'm very visual, and Matt's really good with structure. Mm -hmm. And so, I can I can always trust that if I lay down a scene and there's not enough structure, he's going to fix that, and I'm I'm going to fix like, you know, the thing we always talk about where well, you know, we we will always kind of bring out the best in each other in every scene, so we can pass back and forth pretty easily. And we've also learned through the years how to behave with each other better mm -hmm. too, so that we're always, we are bringing out the best in each other, not the worst. Right. Because um, we both have older brothers and you know we know what that's like. Who, who's the extrovert and who's the introvert? Guess. <laughs> <laughs> One of us is wearing all black. Um, the uh, brooding writer. Yes, the, uh, the Axel Jew is the introvert. Yeah, and the uh, eager to please guilt-ridden Catholic is the extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Um, Steve, do you still want to direct someday? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that to us was like the handshake promise that night was, have you ever noticed how like, you know, Tommy's always on set and, you know, Aaron's always in the room. Like, let's be those guys. Let's be Tommy Schlamme and Aaron Sorkin. And, you know, that because... Now we're not saying that we're Tommy Schlamme. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the end goal is like, uh, when we have our own show, Matt is in the room, I'm on set which much to Matt's chagrin these days is not gonna be in a soundstage down the street, is likely going to be someplace awesome like Hawaii or Prague. Sorry, buddy. Yeah. But that was the promise we made. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a marriage in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uncomfortably so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got some questions here from our audience members. The first one's from Simone Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the fiance, no? Yeah. So, to Mine, Matt. fellas. <laughs> <laughs> so not not to you, but to Matt. What was your dream novel to write? You mean like one that someone else already wrote before me, and I could just wipe that? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't. I think like the closest thing to it would be uh, Kurt Vonnegut, because it's like it was a. He was the guy who, when I read him, it like blew up a part of my brain. So I was like, yeah. oh, I didn't know you could do this. Like yeah. there was this kind of. It was like science fiction, but it's literature, and it's really funny, but it's not goofy. And it was just like a mixture of so much stuff thrown into a blender, and it somehow works and came out and had meaning to it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then I read like a bunch of his stuff, and like the world ended every time, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> dude, come on, like lighten up a little a bit, you know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it would be uh, it would be something of a Kurt Vonnegut ilk, I would think. And to Steve, what is your dream project to direct? Oh, that's a good question. I think it would be... My novel. <laughs> <laughs> Are there Nazis in your novel? <laughs> there can be. <laughs> There's probably lots of people blowing up and dying. Yeah, I would say, I would say it, um, Raiders is the safest bet, only because I know that they made Raiders because no one would let Spielberg make a James Bond movie, and that would be my second choice. All right, all right. Now, uh, this one's from uh, our Twitter follower, at C. Kukahiko. Uh, this, <laughs> I wonder who that is. <laughs> uh, this is from Matt. Uh, how is the Emerson Network here in LA for alumni? I think it's for you. No, say Pete Giovanni, Charles Gay. Oh, yeah. Just answer the question. <laughs> oh, wait, it is. You yeah. went to Emerson. But, but, the, but the, 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 the funny <laughs> thing is, is he totally is like grandfather, and now no one questions I, I've learned all the shibboleths to get by in an Emerson conversation yeah. and, and can have a good 20 minute conversation and no one will know I did Did you Did you study the map of the campus so you I've been to the campus and I know it and I know, I know about the lim I, I know about the little building, yep. I know about Charles Gate, I know about Pichabani, yep. I know about all those guys, so yeah. I can, Checks I can out get, everybody, right? I can get by <laughs> if I need to. Yeah. I can say secondhand that the uh, alumni network is strong because you can't <laughs> walk five feet without running over one of them. Uh, yeah. So that's why I got in to the mob mm, through a side door. Mm, you were so smart. <laughs> Um, but for you, how is the network working out? Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's great. I think um, these days I, I like more being um, kind of like a, a mentor. It sounds, makes me sound like I'm 100 years old. But like, <laughs> I, the only thing I wish I'd gotten from Emerson was for someone to say, if there was more preparation for what it's really going to be like when you get out here yeah. and how to survive. And so anytime any, anybody from Emerson emails me, 
I've said to the people in Boston, like, if anyone's nervous about moving out here and how do we do it and what do we do and what, what should we be, like, how does this work? Mm -hmm. Send them to me, I'll talk to them and I'll try to give them the roadmap that I, th I think I would have wanted back what, in the what day. What is that roadmap? Uh, you know, it's, it's, you'll get a lot of questions like, I wanna be a writer. Um, can I do it from here in Boston? <laughs> No, no. Move to Los Angeles. Mm. Well, but I mean, you can email everything now. That's always the first can... three questions. Yeah. But can I? No. Move to Los See Angeles. See my first two questions. And then, you know, get a job in the industry. Yeah, but I don't want to be a PA on a show. Funny you say that because I didn't either. Turns out I wouldn't have a career if I didn't take that job as a PA on a mm -hmm. show. And you know, the work was long and hard. And if you didn't do it right, you got yelled at. But I'm here because of it and better for it. That actually leads to the next question from another Twitter follower at Eric D. Altman. Uh, is there any particular linchpin in your lives that if it never happened, you wouldn't have achieved the, your current success? It's got to be that job, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So you would have never met. Yeah. Right. I mean I, I mean, I would also say Emerson was a big part of it, too. Mm -hmm. um, but that job on the West Wing is what changed my life because I would still be teaching history to Yeshiva. Yeah, the, there's, <laughs> there's, like the, <laughs> there's the two roots in your mm -hmm. career, and one is working on your craft, and the other is working on your career contacts and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And so when you're working in the industry, you can actually do both because you are you're soaking in, especially on a show like that. Like we soaked in so much creatively right. that when we started writing, like just writing our first spec as a West Wing spec, you have to deconstruct the show before you can rebuild it. Yeah. And we did a good enough job that people were like, this could be, we could air this episode. Right. And so then we brought that to other shows and we're like, well, okay, on one West Wing, the way they would work it, we could like talk really deeply about the structure of the show and then apply it. Mm -hmm. And so. The, the reason why working in this industry is so helpful is that you're going to need to do both things. If you can do them both simultaneously, mm -hmm. then you know, you're making the best use of your time. Right. Absolutely. Um, this one is from another Twitter follower at uh, Neela Knight with a K. Any tips to sticking with your gut and not just doing what's hot? Oh, I never did what's hot. I started making <laughs> movies in my backyard with my buddy Chris Rogowski where we would like videotape our Star Wars action figures. Like I, that's- I, I think every person I've interviewed on this show has that same story. Yeah. Every person. Like we had a mom's geek. camcorder <laughs> and we were videotaping stuff yeah. in our backyard. Yeah. yeah. Not cool. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, and then, uh, you know, I went to Emerson College, it, you know, when everybody was obsessed with Pulp Fiction and I was making Spielberg movies or trying mm -hmm. to make Spielberg movies. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just like, you gotta do what you, Care about because that's the only way it will be real. Yeah. yeah, I think there's there's something to also like you have to check that you're not doing something out of pride or ego. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I, I wouldn't want to say how just can, everybody. How can you know the difference of uh, what's going on like, here versus here? There is a there is a point in your life where you 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 know you say this is the right thing to do, and then you find out because you run face first into a brick wall. That mm -hmm. was the wrong thing to do. Okay, right. so what happened to me there? My my instincts were wrong. Mm -hmm. So if you're always testing your instincts, you're always like, well, here's what I think will happen. And then that thing happens, mm -hmm. okay, your instincts are good. Maybe the world around you doesn't know it, mm -hmm. but you know they're good and you know I can trust, you know, and I have friends, you have to like develop that core group of people who aren't gonna lie to you, who aren't gonna read your script and say, this is awesome, but they're mm -hmm. gonna be like, okay, here's, you know what I mean? Like, they're just gonna be honest with you. When you have honest people around you. That's what's you, great about a group like we yeah, may yeah. make movies, by the way, is you can get honest feedback from people you don't know. You need somebody to check your ego at every step. Yeah. And so it's like, I think once you've done that kind of like soul work, mm -hmm. where you're, you, you know the difference between when I'm, I am driven by ego or pride or I'm driven by, I can't forget this idea. And mm -hmm. I wake up with it and I go to bed with it. And every time I'm just driving around, it keeps popping in my head. Okay, that's an idea you have to write, you mm -hmm. know? So I think that, if you can almost like a uh, like in Dances with Wolves and he tries to get the wolf to run away from him and the wolf keeps coming back, it's like if you can do that with an so idea. So heartwarming. I know. It's, you know, if you can do that with an idea where you could be like, get away, idea, and then the idea keeps keeps coming back and you're like, oh, you idea. You know, then it's like, okay, this must be done because I cannot avoid it being done, mm -hmm. and that, that's how I know I have to move forward. With All right. It. I think another great way to see if. Um, you're gonna beat Dance with Wolves. If you're, I'm not gonna beat it. <laughs> uh, the like for me, it's look around. If you're still surrounded by people who are there to help you, and they're like, okay, let's. What's the next movie we're all making? Like, how do we do this? Tell, what do you need? Mm -hmm. how, how can I be a part of this? If you still have all those people around you that are supportive when things are crappy and aren't just there when things are great, mm -hmm. then that is passion. That's your passion showing through. When you're a prideful asshole, you're not gonna have a lot of people around. Yeah. You know, one of the, the things that really inspired me about you guys was that, you know, you didn't choose to take the independent film route, uh, even though we invited you on the show anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think that most people in this industry, they 
they do the independent thing because they just want to get their stuff made. Mm -hmm. They just want to get their ideas made. Um, whether it gets picked up or not, it's just about getting their ideas out there. Um, for new writers that maybe, you know, like you would know from Emerson College or just people out there listening to this podcast, what is some of the best advice that you can give for new writers starting out in just getting out there and getting their stuff made? It's going to sound dumb. Or not even, as a writer, write. And if you want to direct, direct. Like, if you're directing, you know, movies on your iPhone, do it. You're going to learn a lot. If you're a writer, write every day. Mm -hmm. You know, you just got to keep doing it. Yeah, it's, it's weird because it's like the, so much has changed even since we came up. Even since we started in the industry, the mm -hmm. industry has changed radically. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, the problem isn't getting out there anymore. The problem is separating yourself from all the noise that's out so there. Like, anybody can do it. Right. It's, can you be good? Right. And so, I would say... You know, first you need that drive to I'm going to do it, and mm -hmm. then you need the openness and the lack of ego to listen to feedback when mm -hmm. you get it. And when you, if, so, if if you give your script to people and everyone keeps giving you the same note, like this character is really unlikable. Mm -hmm. You can't just keep saying to everybody, no, no, it's supposed to be that way because <laughs> everyone's telling you I don't like it, and right. I'm your audience right. member, yeah. so right. change it. You know, right. and so it doesn't mean you have to do it the way they would do it. It means like. The, everything we're doing is for an audience. Right. So yeah. take it, your friends are your first audience and if you trust them, listen to them and then make your stuff better and then eventually you'll start to separate from the noise because most people are not, they're not working to improve their stuff. Mm -hmm. They're just kind of vomiting stuff out there. Right. Because it's so easy to do now, there's mm -hmm. no barrier to do it. Mm -hmm. And so they're just doing the first thought that comes to them. Mm -hmm. But if you're the person who's doing like, the fifth thought that comes to you and you're working on it and you're making the, and then you're drawing more and more talented people to you, then you're the guy with the YouTube clip that looks really good. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? And it's like actually kind of funny and that's the stuff that goes viral. One of the things that you guys said to me in a previous conversation as well was um, every time you found yourself in a bad situation, you would just write your way out of it. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. always your outlet. No matter what was going on in your lives, you would just, okay, well, I can't be happy about this, but I'm just gonna do mm -hmm. this instead yeah. because maybe it'll lead to something new. So much about this business is not having control, mm -hmm. unless you're Spielberg. And even even he, I bet, can tell you a story about a thing he wants to do. Like, no one would let him make a James Bond movie. Even today, he, no one would let him do it. You know, so you've just gotta make your own thing. You've gotta do what you're passionate about. And I think another, Another way of answering the last question, but also articulating this thing is just say yes mm -hmm. as often as you can. Go to movies that you wouldn't ever go see. Mm -hmm. When your fiance is like, we should watch this. And you're like, why would I want to watch that? <laughs> Do it. Because hey, you're going to learn woman. awesome stuff maybe. Listen to your woman. And <laughs> just write points on our thing. <laughs> but also like when a buddy is trying to make a movie. Yeah. Do you need it? Hey, do you, can you come, you know, hold a boom? Yes. Because you don't know who you're going to meet, what you're going to learn. That you're going to learn you love sound way more than mm -hmm. directing. Because like when you're the sound guy, you are you have one of the most important jobs. And by the way, nobody knows you're doing a good job unless you fuck it up, right? <laughs> <laughs> to a sound it's guy over there. I mean, I can hear it, right? It's like that, that's hard work. Yeah. It yeah. also it might sound counterintuitive, but um, there's a. You have to think about what is my ultimate goal and what part of my brain does that use? Mm -hmm. And whatever part of your brain that is, don't take a job that makes good enough money but won't satisfy you right. because you will never, you will always be too exhausted to do the thing you need to do and you'll always be making too much money to go backwards. So Ooh, for, that's a, a good one. for a long time, I was like, I had, you know, at, at a certain point I was like, do I give up on this thing? Do I go into like marketing or whatever? Mm -hmm. Or why I never became an English teacher was because I'm like, I'll use that, my writing part of the brain all day long and I'll never be able to write. Mm -hmm. But when we were working on the West Wing and running around, you know, 80 hours or more a week, I was exhausted, but the part of my brain that writes, that part was just wide awake. It was like, right. you're not using me at all. You know I, mean? <laughs> I was just doing stupid, repetitive work all day. Right. And so that part needed to be expressed. And so we would then on the weekends, pour it out of our brains mm -hmm. and you know so i think there's a certain point where you have to decide do i want to make a good living mm -hmm. or do i need to do this thing and if i need to do this thing whatever i'm going to do to make my living and just to eat it can't be too overlapping to that yeah. that it'll take away my drive to do it all right well that's about all the time we have for today thank you guys so much for coming to the show mm -hmm. um i know you guys are working on the zorro script right now hopefully that'll make it to theaters sometime uh, <laughs> uh, is there any way that people can follow you i either by a blog or twitter I've never tweeted, but I have my name, which is Matthew at Matthew Fetterman. You know, but I've never actually tweeted. So. Well, we'll, we'll, you can follow me, we'll but follow I will follow you, that. and you'll start getting our tweets. You'll start getting our tweets. I think I want to be the. I've never tweeted there. I want to be. I want to beat you, by the way. I want to be the most followed person on Twitter for not posting anything. Mm. I think I'm. Steven it's on, Skyer. sir. Yeah, it is on. It's uh, my Steven name Skyer. as well. Right. So yeah. Awesome. Well. Um, 
Thank you so much for joining us today, Steven Skaya and Matthew Fetterman, uh, the writing duo extraordinaire. Uh, we really appreciated all of your advice and your story. Thanks for having us.